Good afternoon and welcome to the Live Wire. Today we have Director of Galleries for the College of Arts and Architecture, Krista Camarado, with us. And I'm Meg Whalen. I'm Director of Communications and External Relations for the College of Arts and Architecture. And we're going to talk today about a great exhibition that opens a week from tomorrow on Friday, September 18th at our Projective Eye Gallery at UNC Charlotte Center City. It's called Amalgamation, the Mixed Media Works of Albert Chong. So welcome, Krista. Thank you, Craig. Tell us who Albert Chong is. Well, Albert Chong is a very distinctive um, hybrid. He is a Chinese Jamaican um, who grew up in Jamaica, um, but then did all of his schooling in the United States and then um, proceeded on to be a professor and a great exhibiting artist representing Jamaica in the first and only time that they appeared at the Venice Biennale. He's a Guggenheim Fellow. Um, but his hybridization, which is so magically wonderful about him, really mixes some Catholicism, um, some kind of Ital Rastafarianism, and a little bit of voodoo in his kind of creative practice. Um, he's also a, a wonderful professor. He was my professor in the mid-90s, um, and he was a very permissive but direct professor, and I believe that that's how he goes about his artwork. Well, great. Well, we have some pictures um, today for people to see some of the photography. We'll have primarily photography yes. in the With exhibition, some but we're going to have some installation. <laughs> Um, tell us a little bit about what that installation is. He has his, um, he's sent over his throne for the third millennium, and it's a very beautiful throne. Thrones are a very big symbolic object in his work. Thrones um, obviously signify the body, um, but an empty throne kind of invites an entity, um, whether it be a physical body or, or a spiritual one. Um, his throne for the third millennium, I believe, is really directed at what's coming next. It's, it's a little bit more on the generations to come, a little bit more focused on that and kind of channeling that energy. Um, it's a beautiful star of duck feathers with a golden stairway leading up to a very beautiful antique chair that has antelope hide wings. And it also inspires audience participation when one sits in the chair the giant antelope wings start to move. Yeah, and um, I had originally intended on maybe trying to place that somewhere else in the community, but I loved it so much I had to have it within the installation. And a lot of his work, being the mixed media artist that he is, as you know, um, is about creating a setup or a still life or a, an altar in front of the camera and then photographing it. So a lot of the flat photographs will really have a very large three-dimensional mixed media element to them, also that relates to the throne that'll be in the center of the gallery. Great, well let's look at some of the pictures and you can tell us um, sort of the symbols that we see. Um, here's the, the screen slide that tells us, reminds us that the opening is from six to eight on Friday, September 18th, and Albert Chong will be here. He will be here. He's going to give a private lecture for students before the opening. Yeah, which is a nice yeah. thing. Photography students from yeah. our university and some surrounding schools, and then he'll also give a little public lecture at the, um, at the evening event around yes. 7.30 or so. So, uh, and from what you have said to me, he's a very entertaining speaker, lively and fun. And yes, and we better make sure our sound system is working really well when he lectures, because usually he's dancing. Oh, great. And talking <laughs> at the same time. So here is, here's a throne. <laughs> here's a throne, which is the perfect thing to segue to. Um, those are his dreadlocks on the throne. They have been cut off uh, of his own head and put onto the chair. Um, and there's a naming book, a copper naming book there. Um, there's also all of these coconut shells around it. Um, so there's a little Santeria kind of voodoo element to it, but there's also just his own way of looking at life. And the coconuts and the fact that the coconuts are cut open 
is pretty significant because they become like receivers or vessels for energy to come in. Um, and as an artist, he really goes about these things in kind of an alchemical way, but not with an overblown symbolism to him. He kind of leaves them open. Any, any spiritual practitioner or um, art and symbolism expert could go in there and find a lot of meaning, and he wants to leave them very open to that. And I see there's a little nest of eggs. There's a nest the of eggs, also with center. holes in them. Yeah. Yes. So is that a similar kind of... It's a similar kind of, you know, the open vessel inside the egg and the egg that holds, um, you know, fertility and life. Um, and the coconut also is a very Ital kind of Caribbean nourishment, um, obviously very popular in today's culture because it's so healthy right. for you. So he took all of these things and assembled this still life thrown set up and then photographed it. Yes, and it's and important to note, I'm glad you're slowing me down on that, because it's important to note that he's photographing these um, with old school silver Polaroid negative yeah. film. It and has a very interesting silvery, silvery look to it. And that comes from exposing the Polaroid negative a little early and opening it up to some solarization, which is a really fun process in and of itself. Yeah. Um, Here's another throne. This one doesn't look very comfortable to sit it's in. Not as, yeah, and so we talked, uh, Albert and I have talked a lot about thorns recently because there's a lot of thorns in his work. And to be sharp and thorny and pointed is actually something that's thought of um, as being strong in Jamaica and having a certain level of potency and you can't be messed with because you have that's this thorn and it's, it's a protect, you know, the thorns are a protective mechanism. In any kind of a plant, the thorn is there so it doesn't get eaten. And that's interesting because when I saw these, knowing that he had, I think one of his family members was Catholic, so he was basically raised in a Catholic family, but that also adhered to voodoo. And, that's and, various in other there too. and so you think of the <laughs> crown of thorns yeah, I at the crucifixion. And exactly, so. and I wouldn't, I wouldn't negate that symbolism in there at all. I mean, yeah. that's part of it too. And in Christianity, that would be a symbol of strength, I guess, right. too. And so this has, is that him sort of appearing? That is him and, and a little bit of his face. He does these time-lapse um, images where he kind of appears for a moment. Um, this is obviously a very bountiful kind of nourishment, celebratory, fruits of the earth, um, kind of an altar that he's making there. and. You know, also a skull of some sort. <laughs> yeah, and there's usually a tradition of thanking your ancestors and Santeria and other um, practices where the ancestor is always present right. and should kind of always be in the room. So I think that those skulls, he has different skulls. A lot of times they're monkey skulls. Yeah, this one Sometimes looks like it other. must be. And yeah. I guess historically in still life, you find skulls too as a reference to the... I mean, I know yeah. in museums, They're, seeing old, you know, Renaissance era or whatever, there's often a skull, not a monkey skull, but... Yeah, but they're a very potent a, image and right, symbol on so many levels. The yeah. reminder of our short life on Earth. <laughs> and this is, well, that's true, our temporal existence. Our temporal existence. <laughs> yeah. um, this is a great one to kind of tie into the Catholicism. You know, this is definitely more of an offering to the ancestors with a glass of water and adding the crucifix in there and even more hair that's kind of cascading down. Right. A lot more simple, a little bit more direct, um, but also very open-ended. I mean, I think he still goes into all of that still life work, which is past works of his. This is, the show is going to be a retrospective, so right. these are some of his works from the late 90s and uh, mostly um, the throne pieces. But I think he really just goes in there trying to figure something out for himself. And so the practice of doing that in a creative way is almost the same thing as the spiritual co component to it. Right. Well, and he also makes references to even contemporary political issues. And I, this reminds me of the art work his uh, Andre Serrano right that it was does. so um, the controversial yes. and, and I would imagine he's 
not he's, he, well, ignorant I mean, of that reference as well. He is not ignorant to that as a photographer and yeah. a professor and, and, and actually teaching primarily a larger bulk of his teaching probably was done during that era of sensationalism of photography where Andre Serrano was very popular. Mm -hmm. So here's more thorns. These are a little bit more the direct. Skulls. Yeah. And the and the skulls and the horns, you know, and the horns obviously a male potency kind of thing um, in there and those being the base of a chair. And um, you know, there's a lot of symbolism in the chair. There was a lot of um, moments in African history where you couldn't take over a tribe or a tribal member if they still had their chair, because their chair was this place where they communed with other things that made them strong. Mm -hmm. So there was this whole idea around the chair in that regard, right. too. It's definitely a monkey skull in that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a few. A little bit of burning. What is the process that makes this look the way it does here? It's well, it's still the solarization, but sometimes the solarization really brings down the contrast in an image. Um, this particular solarization is a still life. There's a whip, obviously, hearkening back to slave times, um, and some other a cowrie shell. You know, the cowrie shell is very symbolic in a positive and negative way. Um, in a kind of pan-African sense. You know, it was used to buy slaves, but it was also used to pay people, and it was some of the first currency ever, and is really seen as a fertility from the ocean, or mother ocean. Mm -hmm. But the solarization, which is the area that's really great, um, which should be shadow, but is now more silver, mm -hmm. is where the, you actually open up a gelatin silver element, meaning film or a or paper that still has gelatin silver on it and you re-expose it to light so there's kind of a second exposure to light and it magically or tragically <laughs> fills mm. in um, the shadow areas with this silvery kind of dusty look and makes it look very um, very much like a silver print it's something mm. that's really hard to duplicate in today's digital arena And I love this. There are a couple like this where he's really a ghost-like figure in his own, a self-portrait, but he's not, he's only somewhat Barely. there. <laughs> and it brings up that idea of temporal again. Um, I think, so again, I think he's being intentional about some things and a little bit ritualistic, bringing in the coconuts and some living things or recently living things. And he shows up for a moment. So the exposure is actually a longer exposure where um, he just comes in and out maybe during a minute long exposure and he's maybe there for 10 seconds oh. within the exposure. So he gets that ghost look. Yeah. Um, he's very good at self-portraiture and including himself um, within his work in very different ways. This is a, a little bit more of a direct way actually. Mm. Although he's see-through. <laughs> <laughs> And so I know that he often, in, in his portraits, they're often not only self-portraits, but portraits of family members and bringing in that sense of ancestry in a, in a communal, large way, but also in a very personal way, his own family, his own ancestors. Um, so is this a family member of Yes, this his? is his father, his who father. I think was extremely significant in his life. Um, and I think he has this addressing the... Um, Chinese American business community. Mm -hmm. um, what's really interesting again is that he also in some of these copper matted pieces he'll write the story and transcribe the story in part on the mat which you know copper is kind of a superconductor mm -hmm. electrically and has all these other beautiful qualities to it so he's kind of shimmering back on the story of his father as he you know, creates several levels of the piece. You know, first, the image of his father, as his father's already gone, so it's an old image that he's right. bringing back up, and creating a still life around it, and then putting a mat with some of the story and some of the symbols that he remembers right. or attributes to it in the copper mat. And a number of these um, portraits will have that copper. Yeah, right? I think we have about five. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, even our signage will be copper. and. Yeah. Our envelopes were copper, so we were definitely um, 
playing with that playing with um, the material. Yeah. Here's another one. Is this also of his father? This is also of his father, and it's his father addressing the spirit. And so I think that is also why he's kind of using two different um, toners. There's like an old school blue gelatin silver toner on um, part of the image, and then he rubbed off the rubber cement to allow his father to kind of pop mm -hmm. from that. And he also relates to the copper and the story around him. Um, looks like a nice, some beautiful symbolism on the bottom there and some little family drawings. And um, He talks fondly of his father and how his father would bring in, you know, the Catholic priest to bless the house, um, but also a, a Santeria person to, when things got really bad, <laughs> or a voodoo um, shaman when things got a little bit different and um, they needed some help. So his family was almost spiritually bilingual in that way. <sighs> and these are some of the cowrie shells um, with, it looks like, I think this is several part portraits. of his, and then several a, portraits in his passport. Or a driving license a driving or license. something. Yeah, a driver's um, license. Of and so with a lot of those and with some of the more political ones that I felt were really important, to add to the show, which we can talk about in a minute. I think he's just looking back to that person and his family's identity and what they had to go through and how they were looked at within the society at that time, that they had to have this kind of identity able to be seen at all times because they were trying to move in different circles. And the cowrie shells, again, are a multifaceted symbol of you know, the great mother ocean, but also currency, supposedly the first currency, um, and selling of slaves, which is a negative thing. A lot of his family portraits came from his family wanting, you know, knowing, and many photographers can relate to this. Can you fix our family portraits? They have rips in them. Yeah. And so he loved the rips, yeah. I think and played with that and really wanted to embellish the histories that were somewhat unseen in China, a brighter light on them and bringing them out to an audience to look at. And so um, I think these are all of his cousins. And there's so time. many things to look at in one of these, um, the feathers and the petals and the water droplets on the leaves and the fork and knife and I mean just there's so many things to think about when you there see is. the, the and some more skulls in there yeah. deep underneath and even the burlap you know and that right. idea of transporting of things with burlap and that idea of travel and definitely a place setting for dinner yeah <laughs> you know? I know yeah. <laughs> and more children from yeah, and these are, you know, they're losing, they're really losing, um, you know, the, the result of some of the degradation of this photograph is that the fixer probably wasn't holding the silver in there and they're disintegrating. Mm -hmm. And so he plays with that and then also embellishes them with all these little wings and apples and, you know, soda from Jamaica and um, a little bit of burning incense and other things. Um, and then the bleeding hearts. Um, he has, I think this is the beginning, let's see, the, um, he has one cousin, Shirley, his cousin Shirley, um, who he's done a lot of work with, and his aunt Winnie, who he did a lot of work with also. And so I asked him, you know, why are you doing work about the distant relatives, you know, except for his father and not your own mother? and. Uh, and he really was attracted more to the stories that were a little bit more tragic, mm -hmm. that needed to be aired and healed a little bit better. And I think his Aunt Winnie just had a really tough go of love and being married to a different person and her love being married to a different person and um, all these coexistences going on. Yeah. That's his Aunt Winnie. Yeah, she's very lovely here and it's a beautiful portrait. The color with the black and white. And I um, love the little worm in I there, know. too. I know. What is that worm doing there? It's kind of <laughs> it, weird. It, 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 I think it adds this element of something darker going on in the background that's difficult. Yeah. Um, but also yes. part of nature. And her heart, I mean, you know, her heart or solar plexus region with that one flower mm -hmm. petal looks full and almost bloody at the same time. Yeah. You know, like almost like a glass of wine or watermelon. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, this is one of my favorites, I think, because it's very well orchestrated and there's a calmness to it. Mm -hmm. There's a calmness to her face, but there's a calmness to how he went about right. embellishing Arranging. it. Yeah. Very lovingly and very empathetically. His work is extremely empathetic towards his family, which yeah. I can really, I think a lot of people can relate to. This is more of the story of his Aunt Winnie and um, the distance that happened between her and the man that she loved and um, over continents and all kinds of things. This is Coronation of a Black Queen. And um, in Jamaica, if you call a woman a queen, you are calling her the best thing you could. You know, so you're giving her respect mm -hmm. by saying that. Um, this is his cousin Shirley, <laughs> and he's decorating her. It's beautiful how the matriarchs were like really a big thing in his life, I think. Um, so she's decorated and he's coronating her as a black queen. <laughs> I think that's a little cousin Shirley again, and those bright, bright little yeah. marigold pieces. Yeah, the perfect. flowers, the colors and the flowers that he uses are so vivid. They're, yeah. And the mm -hmm. old photograph in reference to the old photograph and the old right. instant photograph. And even just that reference to childhood and the sweetness of those times that are very universal. Mm -hmm. And the nostalgia of those times for everyone. This is one of the more political pieces. Yes, and we um, felt like it was very important to have this piece in there. This is a tribute to um, James Byrd, um, who was murdered. Um, it was a hate crime and um, brutally murdered by some white supremacists. And as a result, um, there's been an anti-hate crime legislation that came out. But this is, again, Albert's way of, I'm not sure exactly if he found it this way or if he recreated it this way. It looks like his style. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, even with the blue and the browns and the beiges, um, right. that's very Albert, I think. Um, but it's definitely kind of deified <laughs> um, with the roses around it. And it's a way for him, I think, to cause people to look at those moments as very pregnant with opportunity to change, but also is looking at all the strife that led up to that moment that we shouldn't repeat. And again, with empathy. I mean, right. I think there's some empathy in that. I think that's part of the decorating, yeah. is there's this kind of, perhaps, I mean, my read on it is that it, there's a healing that's wanted. This is Jesus, Mary, and the perfect white man. So, uh, <laughs> and you could play around with the perfect white man being, the, yeah, which one that would be. Mm -hmm. But um, I love that Mary is being portrayed as an African American, mm -hmm. um, and that the Jesus is in there. Um, but then also with this kind of white patriarchy that's problematic on the bottom, almost like a little threat. Yeah. And I love the feather just right over the stomach area of the crucifix, symbolically, again, and the little white cherub. <laughs> um, this is, I believe, his father's speeding ticket. Um, so he's decorating his father's speeding ticket. So I'm sure that in, within that, um, he's you know, paying homage to his, a little bit of his father's oomph <laughs> and speed, obviously, and way of moving through life. And then also there's that empathetic kind of nostalgia looking back. And then here is our original image, the nest. Yes. Again and with the eggs and the, the horns. And um, this is such a beautiful piece that, that he put together and then photographed. He um, is almost like an Andy Goldsworthy, but in the studio. You know, he's, he's a master of arrangement. I think, a symbolic arrangement. Um, he's a different type of that. You know, I think he pulls in these very symbolic, heavy pieces and kind of works out the situation. And this, um, he says, is one of more, his more obscure images, but it has always been one of my favorites um, in reviewing all of his work. And we used it on the announcement, obviously, for that reason. 
Um, it is really simple um, in its presentation of objects, but also there's this great amount of contrast. There's this fragility of the eggs mm -hmm. and those little open areas, and then the strong sturdiness of the horns, also with open areas. And all it's like a vessel within a vessel within a vessel. So there's kind of this mantra of allowing energy to come in, in my, in, in my view of it. He, if he could be here right now, but he will be here next week, <laughs> would, would often say and always say, you know, I want the audience to bring their own symbolism because he's a cultural hybrid and we all are. So people should bring their own sense of symbolism to his work. And he lives now in Boulder. He lives Colorado. now in Boulder and still teaches, teaches there. at the university there. Yes. And while he's here, he's going to do a variety of different teaching opportunities. Um, You're right. Not just with photography students, but with Africana Studies. With Africana Studies, he's, yes. Uh, he's going to be visiting two different classes. He'll be with Felix Germain's class on Monday evening, and he will also be visiting a, a Pan-African class, I believe, on Tuesday. Um, during the day, I think he's going to pay a visit to Eric Watercutty's class. Um, I think we will be working with Africana Studies on creating a panel discussion around some of the um, colonial <laughs> hybridization, pan-African existence that he's, and American existence that he has had, and how that relates to some of their curriculum and their program. Um, and we're doing the student, the, the pre-opening private student um, lecture also bef just to allow students to talk to somebody who does work that's so highly personal but has a little bit of aesthetic di you know, distance in it because I think students are often afraid to do that and Albert's very courageous to think about that. So. Yeah, and people can go, I think we have, there's a college website which uh, has the information about the opening down on our little calendar right there. Um, as a place to go to find out. We will have free parking at Center City we that night. We will have free parking. Reception um, starts at 6, and yes. so there will be uh, wine and, and snacks, and then Albert will be there and speaking at 7.30. Um, this events and exhibitions tab on our website gives all the information you need to find the venue and uh, directions, parking, and, and that sort of information. Yes, and, and we highly suggest parking on the 9th and uh, in between 9th and Caldwell parking area. And we're happy that Center City is offering us parking for everyone for free because it is a bit complicated with all the growth happening That's right, around a Center lot City. Of growth <laughs> And we will have in just the last minute, tell us very briefly about what will be in that front window Oh, of that the is a, a lovely thing also. Thank you for mentioning that. We have Rosalia Torres Weiner did a beautiful mural with the Dreamers um, inspired by content and stories from the Dreamers um, on the side of the building and we extended some of that to include some of her other works in the front. We're going to do a, a Dio de las Muertas um, small reception for her and the Dreamers on October 30th. Yeah, and, and happy it's to very have it. colorful. Very colorful. Not very, afraid of color at all. Yeah, yeah. And it has that really wonderful Central American vibrancy to it. It so. does. The, the idea of decoration and things of, of that sort and, um, you know, the big yellow ochres and bright pinks and reds, she does not veer away from that. And she doesn't, her directness is, is very, I think, similar to that kind of um, portrayal of a story. I mean, she's very dramatic in how she tells the story, which makes it more fun to look at. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you so much thank for you. giving us such wonderful insight into the work that will be on view. This exhibition will be on view through the first week of December, yeah, right? Until December, December 4th. 4th. So please go to the Center City and join us on the 18th for the opening of Amalgamation and then come again to see it over the course of the fall. Thank you for joining us on the Live Wire and join again next week, same time, same place.